morning. Don or Ed is feeling a little dim in here. Are the lights back up? Now I can see people. Thank you. There we go. Love my water. Nothing like it to quench a thirst. Speaking of thirst, this colorful water bottle that I'm holding is a gift to all moms today in honor of Mother's Day. So on your way out, be sure that you stop back at the ushers and the ushers will be handing them out. So make sure that you receive your gift. Before I begin, would you bow your heads with me and pray? Almighty God and Father, we worship you this morning. We thank you this morning. Father, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to receive your word. Not that it would be informational, but that would it, it would be transformational. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, my God and my King. Amen. Have you ever been thirsty? I'm not talking about your average thirst. I mean, really, really thirsty. I'm not talking about the kind of thirst that you get from taking a long walk on a hot day or from doing a workout at the gym. I mean, really, really thirsty, like you've been sucking on a wad of cotton balls for a while. Or maybe like you're so thirsty your tongue is sticking to the roof of your mouth and you've got to peel your lips off your teeth. Have you ever, ever experienced that kind of thirst? You know, thirst is a powerful symbol in the Bible, and it's a prominent theme in the Bible. Water and thirst are rich words um, that are used metaphorically. When, they talk, when Scripture talks about thirst and water, they're talking about to yearn, to long for, to desperately desire. It's not talking about the normal physical thirst. Also, the words desert and wilderness are often used figuratively in the Bible. We think of um, wilderness and desert as this dry, arid location, but really in the Bible it talks about a spiritual longing or a spiritual void. So the concept of thirst becomes a powerful means of communicating spiritual truth. Just as physical thirst can be absolutely excruciating, so too can spiritual thirst. If you've ever been really, really thirsty, then you will be able to connect with thirst in a spiritual sense. In Psalm 63, King David is fleeing for his life from his own son, Absalom. He's a rebellious son who wants, who's plotting to take the throne away from David. So what I want us to do is jump into David's story. Here, David flees to the Judean desert where it's hot and dry and, and barren and there's really no water. And what does David speak of? In the Psalm that Chad, that Chad read for us, David's tired He's hungry, he's exiled from his own kingdom, and what he speaks of is thirst. But it's not his physical thirst he speaks of. Listen to his language. O oh God, you are my God. I earnestly seek you, my soul thirsts for you. He's not talking about the hunger in his stomach or that his mouth is parched. David's very survival is at stake. From enemies, from animals in the wild, from the dry parched land, and what does he speak of? His thirst for God. If I asked you to picture a dry wilderness, a dry barren wilderness, what image comes to mind? Really, I want you to think about it. All right, I'm seeing a lot of blank faces. So let me help you. How about if I ask the ushers to shut the doors and crank up the thermostat for about 95, to about 95 until we're all done? Will that help? People are saying yes, people are saying no, okay. So this means you're gonna to have to use your own imagination. What comes to mind when you think of your wilderness? Perhaps you see endless rolling sands where the heat is coming up off the sand. Or maybe you're thinking of those postcards that say Santa Fe and you see the sun bleached rocks and the cactus and the canyons. It might look picturesque, but now imagine that you're standing there. You're exhausted. You've been exiled from your own kingdom. You're hungry, you're empty handed, and you're really, really, thirsty. Where do you turn? Now what if I asked you to imagine your wilderness? Not a distant landscape, but a place that's closer to home, right here in our hearts, where you might feel isolated, you might feel violated, 
alone, afraid, scared, where perhaps temptation lurks? What does it look like for you? Better yet, what does it feel like? What are you thirsty for? We all thirst for something. We, we thirst for self-worth. We, we, we look for love, power, wealth. You name it, every one of us has a thirst. I like my water bottle. Excuse me. Moms, you'll get one too. But we all have a thirst. You know, you know your thirst. It's that powerful, unquenchable thirst that we think will stay with us all throughout our lives. That's our wilderness. David's wilderness, just like yours and mine, was very real. But the thing that makes David's wilderness and this psalm so special is that David approaches it or addresses it from a place of peace. Listen carefully to what David says. Oh God, you are my God. David's relationship with God isn't hearsay. It's not wishful thinking. He is a close personal relationship with the Lord. He has a history with God. David goes on to say, early will I seek you. My soul thirsts and my flesh longs for you. David's declaring that above all else, no matter what, he is seeking God. His thir he thirsts for God because God is priority in his life. It's not just about the time of day. God is priority in his life all throughout the day. When you're in your wilderness, and maybe you're in one right now, what do you thirst for? Do you long and thirst for God like David? Or is God your last resort? The psalmist continues, I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. David, in his exile and wilderness, longs to worship God above all else, even in the midst of his suffering. He desires God more than life-sustaining water. David knows that the only way through his wilderness is to, is to praise the God who is keenly aware of his thirst. For David, if the issue of deep thirst in the wilderness is the question, then prayer and praise and worship is the answer. Have you experienced the steadfast love of God? David has. By praising God, David knew that it wouldn't take him out of his wilderness, but that it would, it would sustain him through his wilderness. Do you know the hope that God offers? Friends, sadly, we live in a world that is, is after all hot pursuits of quenching our thirst with everything but God. Our culture tells us we're not satisfied unless we have the biggest, the best, the newest. But in our quest for more, the real thirst goes unfulfilled. Let me read something to you that I, that I found about the paradox of our time. The paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings but shorter tempers. We spend more but have less. We buy more but enjoy less. We have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences, but less time. We drink too much, spend too recklessly, laugh too little, drive too fast, get too angry, read too little, watch TV too much, and pray too seldom. We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. We talk too much, love too seldom, and hate too often. We've learned how to make a living, but not a life. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but we have trouble crossing the street to meet a new neighbor. We build more computers to hold more information, but we communicate less and less. We've conquered outer space, but not inner space. We've cleaned up the air, but polluted the soul. We've conquered the atom, but not our prejudice. We've learned to rush, but not to wait. These are the days of quick trips, fast food, disposable diapers, throwaway mortality, one night stands and pills that do everything from cheer to quiet to kill. It's a time when there is much in the showroom window and nothing in the stock room. Friends, we rush from here to there trying to satisfy an inborn hunger that God himself has put there. And the only way that we're going to satisfy that hunger is to know God 
have a passionate relationship with God. The world's cisterns will never satisfy our thirst. David knew there was only one solution to the constant yearning of his heart. Only in God's presence and in God's fullness would his deep longing be satisfied. Spiritual thirst is when you deeply and profoundly know your need for that spiritual fullness, just like your parched mouth knows the need for water. I'm not talking about religion here. I'm not talking about just coming to church, although that's great. I'm talking about having a personal, inter intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. The problem is many people thirst for things of the world. Too often we drink from the worldly well instead of from the wells of eternal life. Jesus writes about that ver this very thing in the gospel that Chad read for us, about the woman at the well. Many of you have heard it pro once, if not a thousand times. But I'm going to ask you one more time to listen to it this morning, maybe with fresh ears, with fresh eyes, to see what God might have to say to us today. Let's pick up the story where Jesus and his disciples are leaving Judea and traveling back to Galilee. Now, Jews would normally avoid this route because Jew Jews despise Samaritans. But Jesus, just like Jesus, takes that very route. So here we have an unnamed woman. Tired and hungry, Jesus is resting at a well called Jacob's Well. The disciples have gone back into the town to buy food. The unnamed woman appears. The Bible doesn't tell us her name or her age. All we know is, she, is that she wants a drink of water. But God has another plan. Jesus makes this simple request. Will you give me a drink of water? Stunned. The Jewish woman asks this, the Jewish woman wonders, why is this Jewish man asking me for a drink? She knows the Jews aren't supposed to talk to Samarit Samaritans. She knows that men aren't supposed to talk to women without their husbands present. And she knows that if Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, drinks from her her pitcher of water, he would be ceremonial unclean. And a Jewish rabbi would rather go thirsty than break the rules. But Jesus isn't interested in the rules, which puts this woman a bit on edge. So she reminds him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan, and you're asking me to give you a drink of water? She, she's focused on the law. Jesus is focusing on grace. Having captured her attention, Jesus then says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. See, Jesus used the word living water to refer to eternal life. He refers to it as water that will only satisfy her spiritual need, only found through him. Still, the woman doesn't get it. A gift, she thinks, what kind of gift, what kind of water can come from this well? After all, I've been drinking from this well year after year after year. Friends, have we been drinking from the same well year after year after year? So she asked Jesus, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Now that she asked Jesus, Jesus begins to unveil the truth. He says, whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus reveals to her that the, well from the, the water from Jacob's well can never satisfy her, that it's only the water that Jesus offers that can satisfy her, that goes continually. It never runs dry. Is this woman ready for the leap of faith? Mm, not quite yet. Have you found yourselves there? Maybe you've felt the Holy Spirit tugging, maybe you felt Jesus tugging, but you're not quite there yet. So Jesus confronts her most basic problem, her sin and her need for salvation. So Jesus says, go, call your husband, bring him back. She says, and she confesses, I have no husband. Then Jesus gently exposes her sin and says, you're right. You've had five husbands and the man you're with now He's not your husband. Does she immediately fess up? Nope. She does what we often do. She changes the subject. She starts talking about Jerusalem and, and worship and the difference between Jews and Samaritans. Finally, not knowing what to do, the woman wants to shut Jesus down. So she says, I love this, when the Messiah comes, he will explain everything to us. 
Jesus finally now can drop the bomb. I who speak to you am he. Can you imagine? All of a sudden, her wheels start turning and everything starts clicking. And she realizes that this encounter she is having may be the encounter with Christ himself. The gospel then tells us, overjoyed, she heads back to town. She drops her pitcher. She's not interested any longer in her spiritual thirst. She's more interested in telling people about her new faith. So she, run back to the ta- she runs back to town and says, come, come see a man who has told me all about myself. Come, can he be the Christ? Can he be the anointed one? As we look at this encounter between the Samaritan woman and Christ, friends, I ask you, how does it compare to your response to our Lord? Maybe there's a reason this woman's name is unknown. Maybe it's because God wants us to write our name in the margin. Maybe without her name, we are free to step into her story. Is our thirst only for worldly wells? Are we skeptical when we hear that Jesus offers us living water? It's only when we meet Jesus, acknowledge and confess our sins, and experience God's grace can we drink from the living waters that he offers. When we come to the well, He has everything we need. I want you to watch and listen and enjoy. what you need but you keep on searching I've done all the work but you keep on working when you're running on empty you can't find the remedy just come to the well you can spend your whole life Chasing what's missing, but that empty inside, it just ain't gonna listen when nothing can satisfy and the world leaves you high and dry. Just come to the well, and all who thirst will thirst no more. No.
anymore When your last prayer is spoken Just rest in my arms a while You'll feel like the change, my child When you come to the world where are you this morning? Do you better identify with David's story? Do you have a deep personal relationship with Christ? Do you thirst and seek him daily? Have you experienced his love and his faithfulness? Do you praise him even when you're in your wilderness? Maybe this morning you identify with the woman at the well and you've already written your name in the margin. Have you spent too much time drinking from polluted wells? From those that can't satisfy and leave you parched? What is it that prevents you from coming to Jesus? Are you afraid that your sin is too great? Not so. Jesus says, whoever drinks of this water. That's an invitation for all of us. If you're trying to satisfy your inborn hunger in your own strength, turn to turn to the Lord and ask him to give you a God-given thirst. It's time to stop drinking from polluted wells and come to Jesus thirsty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. Stay thirsty, my friends. Stay thirsty for Jesus. <laughs> 